Today, we're looking at the parable of the rich man in Luke chapter 12. And if you don't find yourself in this parable, well, there's just something not human about you. You're watching The Caffeinated Bible. My name is David Paris, and the goal of this channel is to take what I've been teaching in seminary and bring it to you on YouTube. So if you like this material, please give it a thumbs up, let other people know about it, and subscribe to the channel. That way YouTube will let you know when I post new videos. So before we go any further, I suppose we should read our text. Luke 12, 13 through 21, the parable of the rich man. Someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, friend, who set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have no place to store my crops. And then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves and are not rich towards God. This section of Luke's gospel is unique to him. It's neither in Mark nor Matthew. And if we go back to the charts from last week, this would be some of the purple area that we talked about, unique material to each gospel. And it's not just this passage. Luke is unique in that he preserves Jesus' teachings that emphasize God's favor on the poor, the humble, and those that are on the fringes of society, as opposed to the rich. On the flip side, Luke also preserves Jesus' teachings that condemn the wealthy and that claim that their wealth is theirs and theirs alone. And I'm not talking about one or two examples here alone. These themes and teachings permeate Luke's gospel. For example, in chapter 1, in Mary's Magnificat, verses 51 and 52, she sings, He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones, and he has lifted up the lowly. And he has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. In chapter 6, when we reach the Beatitudes and the Woes, Jesus pronounces, Blessed are you who are poor, 620, this stands in contrast to his judgment on the rich. Woe to you who are rich. The parable of the great banquet in chapter 14 concludes with those who have been invited rejecting the invitation. The master then sends his servants out to bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Moving on a little bit further, the story of the rich man Lazarus strongly condemns the life of the rich who do not show concern and care for the poor in their midst. And then in chapter 19, Luke recounts the story of Zacchaeus, a rich tax collector who declares during the meal there that, look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I will repay four times as much. To which Jesus replies, salvation has come to this house today. As a whole, Luke includes more stories about people who are identified specifically as either rich or poor than Matthew or Mark. He also addresses issues of possessions, both material wealth in contrast to spiritual wealth, more than the other three Gospels. This brings us then to the context of our parable today and opens in 1213 with someone in the crowd coming up to him and saying, teacher, Tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. Now, we could read this person's request in one of two ways. First, the implication could be that the older brother or another member of the family is squeezing this person out of their rightful inheritance. I couldn't find a direct example of it, but it appears that the rabbis during this time often interjected themselves in making legal rulings along lines like this. Or if not legal, the respect of the community behind the rabbis would have helped sway the decision that would be rendered. 
In this case, the younger brother or perhaps a sister is trying to find some ground or force their brother to divide the inheritance fairly. Or it could be a situation where the younger sibling wants the family inheritance divided while the other brother wants to keep it undivided and perhaps managed as a whole. A similar situation to what we see taking place in the parable of the prodigal son, who demanded his share of the inheritance be divided, and then he went off and squandered it. We don't know what the situation here is, whether this person is being squeezed out or they want the family estate divided between them. What we do know is that they are trying to involve Jesus in the decision-making process to sway the outcome in a manner that would be more beneficial to them. In verse 14, Jesus replies, Friend, who has set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? Jesus clearly indicates that he has no intention of getting involved in this matter. Instead, it's used as a launch pad to teach about wealth, possessions, and perspective on life. This brings us to verse 16 and the parable itself. The parable opens with the rich man's land being very fertile and yielding an abundant harvest. Land like this would resonate with all the promises that God made in the biblical tradition concerning it being a blessing from God. When Israel was journeying into the land, God promised that it would be a land flowing with milk and honey. Ecclesiastes 5.19 reflects this view. Likewise, to whom God gives wealth and possessions and whom he enables to enjoy them, and to accept their lot and find enjoyment in their toil. This is the gift of God. So this parable starts on a really positive note, and one that everyone would secretly desire for themselves. Man, if my investments would produce an abundant result, I'd be sitting pretty. Especially as right now most people around the world are confronted with inflation and stressful economic outlooks. And no, inflation and weak economic forecasts is not a strictly American problem. It's a worldwide problem, but I digress. 1217, back to the parable. This presents the rich man with a good problem. He has more produce and harvest than he is able to store. So he comes up with a logical solution. Build bigger barns to store his harvest. What's interesting about this parable is that the actions of the rich man are fairly wise. He's building bigger barns, storing up for the future, saving. Life is good. And then, verses 17 through 19, we have an extended soliloquy where this rich man speaks to himself. What should I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul. You have ample goods laid up for many years. Eat, drink, be merry. Let me pull up the NRSV translation on the screen here so we can see what is going on, especially the repetition of first-person pronouns. What should I do? I have no place. I will do this. I will pull down. I will store. I will say. And then that is paired with the possessive pronoun, my, my, my. My, my. Two things come across in this man's reasoning. First, how self-centered it is. It is all I, 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 my, my, my. Second is the lack of any reference to other people or to God. The rich man's ending line, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry, is a very interesting statement. Luke ministered with Paul among the Gentiles in Asia Minor, in Greece and Rome, and probably had a Greco-Roman upbringing himself. So including the last line in this parable here shows sort of a blending of Jewish and Greco-Roman thought. On the Jewish side, the author of Ecclesiastes sought out and questioned what the best life could be that one could live. His conclusion was, in Ecclesiastes 2.24, there is nothing better for mortals than to eat and drink and find enjoyment in their toil. This also, I saw, is from the hand of God. Then in 3.12, he writes, I know that there is nothing better for them to be happy and enjoy themselves as long as they live. Moreover, it is God's gift that all should eat and drink and take pleasure in their toil. He continues on in 5.18. 
This is what I have seen to be good. It is fitting to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun. The few days of the life God gives us, for this is our lot. Likewise, all to whom God gives wealth and possessions and whom he enables to enjoy them and to accept their lot and find enjoyment in their toil. This is the gift of God. So the man saying here really seems to be in line with a lot of Jewish teaching, especially from the book of Ecclesiastes, that the best we can hope for in this life is to be happy and enjoy the pleasures of our toil. On the Greek side, the philosopher Epicurus, who lived around 300 BC, taught that since we do not know what's going to happen to us after we die, the best we could aspire to in this life was to eat, drink, and be merry, because tomorrow we might die. The very motto which this rich man quotes. In a sense, this rich man's concluding line reflected not only Greek, but also Jewish thought, and perhaps the aspirations of most people today, including us. At the same time, this line of thought is qualified in Jewish thought. Unlike Epicurus, who questioned what would happen after death, the author of Ecclesiastes took a very pragmatic approach to this question. What happens to all of your wealth if it goes to someone who squanders it? And in the lectionary readings this week, they pull from Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 114 says, I saw all the deeds that are done under the sun and see that it is vanity and a chasing after the wind. I hated all the toil of my life in which I had toiled on the sun, seeing that I must leave it to those who come after me. And who knows whether they will be wise or foolish, yet they will be the master for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. This then leads us to God's address of the rich man in 1220 in the parable. God says to the man, You fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? And you can see how he's pulling right out of Ecclesiastes here. The answer that we supply is, I don't know. My heir might do well, or they might squander it or it might end up getting fought over like the person who approached Jesus and asked him to tell his brother to divide the inheritance fairly. Fights over families' inheritances are nothing new. The wisdom books in the Old Testament teach us about wisdom and foolishness. What's interesting is this parable combines them both in one story. On the one hand, the rich man is wise to build and prepare for the future and to wisely invest his wealth. He also reflects the teachings of Ecclesiastes that there is nothing better than being able to enjoy the fruits of your labor. On the other hand, he is a fool because his perspective and reasoning is very limited. In his little soliloquy to himself, he only employed first-person pronouns. I, 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 I. My, 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 my. The failure of this approach is revealed when God asks him, what did all this get you? What will happen with all your my, 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 my when you die? Who will get it? Will they squander it or wisely handle it? You don't know. The I, I, I of this story also betrays his lack of reference to any other person or God. Instead of looking at our property as ours, we need to ask ourselves, how much of my life is truly my own? Did I choose to be born? Did I choose to be born in the family that I was, at this particular point in history, into the country that you were born, with the body that you have, when and the way that you will die in the future, etc., etc., etc. If you had no choice in all of these issues, why do we focus so much on such little things by comparison and then think that it is all ours? This is my money or my property. And like the rich man and God's challenge to him, we need to have a change of perspective as well. When God says, this night your life is being demanded of you, the verb demanded comes from the Greek word opteo, and it means to demand back, to ask for it again, like demanding a loan be repaid. It paints a picture that life is a gift from God. It belongs to him and he can demand it back at any moment. This reverses the man's logic of I, 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 and he is a fool because his life is ordered with no reference to God, 
the source of all his life, wealth, and blessings. If you've been following my channel at all for some time, you know that I've developed arrhythmia problems with my heart over the past two years. And I've been doing great, by the way, for the past two months or so. So this parable really cuts a little bit close to home for me. It's not that I'm gonna go with the sun clutching on my chest and going, ah, and then falling over backwards. But most likely it's gonna be with, I feel a bit tired. I think I'll take a nap now and just lie down. In reflecting on this parable and preparing this video, I've been forced to ask, how am I being rich towards God? How am I being wise and how am I being a fool? Notice also that this parable does not say that wealth is bad. Rather, it challenges all of us. How are we being rich towards God? What is my perspective in life? Is it all about me? Do I have a wider perspective in terms of others and in terms of what will happen after I'm gone? How do you see yourself in this parable? When Luke wrote his gospel, this parable would have been a powerful message that challenged the values and social structures both within Israel and the Greco-Roman world. It's a story that forced them to radically reorient their lives and perspectives. At the same time, Jesus doesn't say, do this or give a concrete set of instructions about how to reorient our life. This parable strikes at our desires and how we view the fruit of our lives and forces us to reconsider our perspective. As such, it is open-ended and puts the onus on us to constantly reevaluate our lives. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this passage in the comments down below. Until next week, peace.